O Father, which art in heaven. If ever we need it, you, we need you right now. I believe, Lord, that you are already doing something very special in our hearts. But, Lord, we need so much more for the times that are just ahead of us. And so we're pleading for your presence to be manifested and magnified in even a greater way. That it may break us loose from the sins and selfishness that binds us. Save our families, Lord. Save our church. And then use us to be an instrument in your hands to reach the world. Abide with us now, we pray. Remove me, Lord. I'm fickle, I'm frail, I'm feeble. But you are everything. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. I feel that we are in a very tremendous time, a very tremendous experience. I'm privileged to be here studying with you. Are you ready to study the Word of God? All year long, we look forward to this time when we can gather together in the holy convocation of God to enjoy His presence, to enjoy the fellowship, but most importantly, not just the fellowship of you and I, but the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We need Him more than anything else. Am I right? If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Luke, the 19th chapter. To the book of Luke 19, before we begin to get deep into the Word of God, the book of Luke, the 19th chapter. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to be extremely honest with us as we begin to study the Word of God. I cannot tell us what we want to hear. I've got to tell us with the reality. Is that, is that all right? The condition that we're in is in such a bad shape. We're in such a bad shape. That sometimes when you have to tell the unadulterated truth, it hurts. But we need the unadulterated truth in order to be saved. Am I right? And so my brothers and sisters, this analysis that we're going to get is not an analysis because God is angry with us or he's upset with us. It's an analysis to tell us the true condition we're in so that we can get help from Jesus. I want Jesus to help me. I want him to help our home. But the time in which we live is so critical that it's impossible for you and I to, and I, I'll be honest from the very beginning, I know that we're not going to finish our study. Did you hear what I said? We didn't finish our study from last year. We're at the second night of our study from last year. But by the grace of God, we're going to have to now combine last year with this year and then try to go further because we're falling behind of where God wants us to be. There's so much that is going on right now. My heart trembles as I think of the reality of what's going on in the world and what is not happening in God's church. What is not happening in, in the homes that make up God's church. I'm not just talking about the homes of those in whom we saw they sit on the conference and they, this person. I'm talking about the homes of those who profess to believe present truth. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. I need him. Do you need him? And if Jesus is in our family, guess what we can say? Happy, happy home. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We should be very humble to be at a meeting like this, all of us. Normally, when God uh, in the world, when a person puts together a team, especially if the team is to be a critical team, they put the best players on that team. Am I right? If you ever saw basketball before, before you knew better, I say that, amen. Before you knew better, if you, if you saw that, I remember when I used to play basketball, I was a, a, a point guard. I started, and you were, I remember what it was like when sometimes we would play, and, and, and sometimes if the person scored 10 points, the people would say, y'all had a bad night. We would have 40-point leads and 50-point leads as, as we were put in, and they'll put in the bench, and they'll bring the bench off the, off the, from the stands and put them on the floor. And if ever the leads start going down, you heard the whistle, Whoop! you know what they're bringing back on? Who are they bringing back on? The starting five. Normally on, on, on the teams of this world, 
You put together the best team, an all-star team, so that you can see the, the, the skills manifested if you have such a critical time. But do you know that God, in the final generation, does not put the best players on the team? He doesn't put the best players on the court. Do you know that God is actually taking the worst generation, the last generation, the least generation, we're the weakest physically, we're the weakest mentally, we're the weakest spiritually, and God is putting us on the field, on the court, and if we lose, the entire great controversy is lost. You'll say, what a fool that is, but no, God is not a fool, he's a wise coach. And Jesus understands if someone were different, were put on the floor, you know where the glory would go if, if someone else were put on the floor. We would think that we did something. But God in the final generation, the final analysis, it will be evident that the work that was accomplished inside of God's church was accomplished by the power of Jesus Christ. And it will be God and God alone. I want to give that demonstration, what do you say? And so you and I should be very humble when we see an experience like this that God would choose us at the most critical hour of earth's history. And when I say the most critical hour, I mean the most critical hour. I'm going to write something on the board. Well, I better not write that on the board. You might get afraid and leave at that time. And I'm, let, me, let me say this first before I write that. <laughs> let me put this down first. Now, we're here because we're seeking an upper room experience. Am I right? Now, the, er the early disciples, they went into an upper room with Jesus by faith. The Holy Spirit was preparing them in that upper room experience. And what were they preparing for? Anybody remember what they were preparing for? What were they preparing for? Thou pouring the Spirit in the form of what? The early rain. They needed that to take the gospel to the entire world. Am I right? Now, you and I are going back into the upper room, that same upper room in principle, but we're not going there for the early rain only. We're going into the upper room experience in this generation for the preparation for the what rain? Not early rain only, but the what? Latter rain. Very good. In preparation for the latter rain. Now, in volume 6 of the Testimonies, page 39, watch what the prophet says. Father, please bless your words we have, as we've opened it. Anoint us and your word with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at what it says. It says, anciently the Lord instructed who? His people to assemble how many times a year? Now, we only assemble like this how many times? But inspiration said anciently they were three times a year. I think we need to start gathering more. What do you say? Now, we're going to unfold something before this camp meeting is over. We have to start meeting together more than we do or we're not going to make it. Do you know a camp meeting is not enough? It's not, we cannot learn everything we need to learn for our families, for our lives by just meeting once a year. We don't have enough time to meet once a year. Inspiration says as we see the day approaching, we should be uh, coming together how? More and more, not less and less. In fact, in that marvelous book, Evangelism, page 17, the prophet of God says, evangelistic work, opening the scriptures. A warning men and women of what is to come upon the world is to occupy more and still more of the time of God's servants. This must consume our whole time, our whole mind, our entire energies. Now, my brothers and sisters. This says that anciently the Lord instructed his people to assemble three times a year for his worship. To these holy what? Convocations. The children of Israel came. They met to recount God's what? So when we come together, we're not coming to recount and murmur. We're coming to recount how merciful has God been throughout the year. Has he been merciful to us? Yes or no? Do you know that many have died from last camp meeting that are not here tonight? That wish that they would be here, but are dead tonight. How do we know that we will make it if God were allow another camp? How will we know that we're just going to make it? You see, somehow we have formed the false idea that we're just going to live and live no matter what we do. But my brothers and sisters, tomorrow is not promised. Whatever we do, we must do it today, right now. This is the acceptable time. Now, watch what inspiration says. It says... They met to recount God's mercies to make known his what? Wonderful works and to offer praise and thanksgiving to his name. And they were to unite in the sacrificial service which pointed to Christ as what everybody? The Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. This is why they met. 
Now watch what it says. Thus, they were to be preserved from the corrupting power of what else? Worldliness and what else? So as they met together, recounting God's mercies, looking to Jesus, it was designed by God to keep them from the influences of the world. So what happens if we stop meeting together like this? We become more worldly. Our minds become more focused on our jobs and on our careers and on the things of this world, and we lose less and less strength. We become less and less focused on the concept of finishing the work. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, Thus, they were to be preserved from the corrupting power of worldliness and idolatry. Faith and love and gratitude were to be kept how? Alive in their hearts and through their association together in this sacred service, they were to be bound how? Closer to what? So through these holy convocations, God was trying to get closer to his people. And then it says, and what else? So it was not only that they were getting close to God, but they were also becoming close to what? So as we meet together in God's appointed way, we're getting closer to God. We're getting closer to each other. And as a united team, we can finish the work. You know that there's no strength in division. The strength comes in unity. The power when we can unite under truth and the devil's plan is to divide us into independent atoms. But by God's grace, God is going to have a body that's going to finish his work. I want to be a part of that body. What do you say? Volume 638. This is the chapter in volume 6 on the camp meeting. It says, it is important that the members of our churches should attend what? Our camp meetings. The enemies of truth are many. And because our numbers are few, we should present a strong a front as what? Possible. Individually, you need the benefits of the meeting, and God calls upon you to number one in the ranks of what? Do you know that every camp meeting, there's a letter that is sent out? And if you didn't get one, we want to make sure you get one. If, if God allows another camp meeting, your mind should be preparing. But before that, we should be saying every time we come together, Lord, there's a preparation for the visitation of God's Spirit. Now, this says, individually, we need these benefits. It goes on to say, some will say what? It is expensive. To try. Now notice, the prophet heard what some would say. And isn't this what they say? Have you almost even thought it before? Some will say it is expensive to travel and it would be better for us to do what? Save the money. Amazing when we want to save money. We didn't save money when we bought that car. We had to have the latest edition. We didn't save money when we bought that iPhone. You probably have iPhone 20 right now. It says, some will say it's expensive to travel and it will be better for us to save the money and give it for the what? Oh, how pious we are. Give it for the advancement of the work where it is so much needed. Do not reason in this way. Who said this? God is speaking through the prophet. It says, do not reason in this way. God calls upon you to take your place where? Among the rank and file of his people. God says, do not reason. I don't have enough money. It costs too much to travel. How is it that we can travel on vacations, but we can't travel a camp meeting? We'll go to Hawaii. Oh, but I can't meet. Oh, the, the, the money chopper room is too much. Uh, but, but brothers and sisters, we are not doing nothing more but deluding our own minds. And if we're lost, we will then look back at all the money that was spent and say, Lord, I wish that I'd use every cent. For the salvation of my family. It won't seem so far. It won't seem like so much money and so much time. But my brothers and sisters. God is trying to show us the significance now. It says. Do not reason this. Strengthen the meetings. Uh, all you possibly can. How? Not by simply saying I'm just going to pray for it. Do that. Yes. But how? By what? By being present. Not by yourself. But by being present. How? With your families, God would endeavor to have a man have his family beside him so he can say like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Blessed is that man that he can look to his right and his wife is beside him. He can look a little further to his right 
and see his daughter or his child beside him. Blessed is that man. That he can look and see that the entire family is there. And if the entire family is not there, he should be praying, dear God, make sure that I get something that when I go back home, I can bring the power of God into my house so that I can set it in order. That wife should be saying, if my husband is not here, I pray God that the Holy Spirit will be so far, far with me that God, that my husband will see Christ in me, that my child will see Jesus. One of the worst things that have happened to our children is not that they have not been taught divine truth, but they have not seen it practiced. It does no good to talk of truth if we will not practice it. Talking of truth without practicing creates hypocrisy and it creates rebellion. But when the child can see the demonstration of Christ, they begin to develop a love to want to follow Jesus. If your child finds it strange for you to stop in the middle of the day and read your Bible, something is wrong. I want you to do a little experiment. I, I tried to tell you this last year, but somehow I left the, <laughs> I left the experience. I went somewhere else. The Holy Spirit took me on. But I, I wanted to remind you uh, of this. Try a little experiment. Just to check and see how things are going. No? Now, if your children are here, you, you, you're not going to be able to get the full experience of it. But if they're not here, you get the full experience. Just go home. When they're not there, just in the middle of the day, when you get there, just stop and take out your Bible and start reading. And if your child stops you, because normally if, you, if, if we were to do that now, you know, a child come in, he said, wait a minute, mom and dad normally on YouTube, that, this is not what they normally do. He said, he come back and he see you reading the Bible. They say, mom, has anybody died? Has something happened? This is normally the reaction. Why? Why would a child react that way? Because it is not normal for them to just see commonly when it's not worship. When it is not a time just to stop and open up our Bibles and start reading. My brothers and sisters, you know that it should be common for children and families to just open the Bible and be able to read and study together. And by, by, by God's grace, we should say from this moment forward, if it is not so, it's going to be so from this moment forward. A new habit. Can be I don't know about you, but I'm going to start a new habit. Do you want to start a new habit? You know, a new habit starts by one action. You start today. Now, this says... Put forth extra exertion to attend what? The gathering of what? God's people. Do you know it took a lot for you to get here? Am I right or wrong? Do you know that the devil tried to attack everything to stop you from coming to this meeting? Because the devil is afraid that you will come in contact with Jesus in these meetings. The devil is afraid. And he should be because Jesus is omnipotent. If we get in contact with Christ, the devil is in trouble. And so his only hope is to keep us from a relationship with Jesus Christ. But by God's grace, we're here. What do you say? And first step, consecrate. We heard that last night. Elder Mason brought us forward telling us of the importance of consecrating. It says, brethren and sisters, let's read this together. It would be what? Far better for you to let your business suffer. Then to neglect the opportunity of hearing the message God has for you. Now, you got to understand what this is saying. Now, most people don't fully get that because most people don't even have a business. Most people just have a job. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go further. But most of you have a job. Now, my brothers and sisters, the, the, the principle still applies. But it's even more significant if you recognize not just the job. Because you, you just own a person a job, then another person would take to your place and it keeps going. But if you own the business, the full direction of everything is with you. Inspiration says it will be better to let your business suffer and you be at camp meeting than you to say, well, I'm just going to send my funds to further the work and yourself and your family not be present. You know, there's some people watching on the Internet. Let me just talk to you in there for just a moment. You, you excuse me, okay? There's some people watching on the internet that should be here right now. And God does not think it's all right for you to sit there when you could be what? Right here. If somebody just want to sit, you know, you know I'm just going to watch. The, can, can you imagine that three times a year they were required in ancient Israel? And some people say, you know what? I'm not going to go up there. I'm just going to watch it from a satellite and back in the time of ancient Israel. Can you, do you think God would have accepted that? He would cry. He required them how many times? Three times physically. And the only thing that would stop them, there had to be an emergency. Now, my brothers and sisters, 
we should make it up in our mind right now. There may not be another camp meeting. That's what we're going to show you is going to be so serious that you're going to see it may not be another camp meeting next year. It may not be. Now, I'm praying that it is. I'm praying that God will give us more time. You know, we're told we should pray for more time. I'm praying, God, please give us a little more time. But my brothers and sisters, as we pray for that, the reason why we should be doing that, we should be saying, if God gives us more time, more convocations, we should say, I make it up in my mind that nothing will stop me from being there. You should make up your mind right now, tonight. Nothing. I don't care what it costs. I don't care what it is. And I'm going to try to help as many people as I know to come. Are you with me? Amen. It says... Make no excuse that will keep you from gaining every spiritual advantage possible. You need how much? Every ray of life. You need to become qualified to give a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You cannot afford to lose how much? Someone says, well, I'll skip this one and go to the next one. You cannot, we cannot afford to, to skip how many? Not even one. I want to redeem the time. What do you say? Now, my brothers and sisters... I'm going to write something on the board now that we began to talk about last year. We're going to talk a little bit more about this year and go deeper in our study of this. I'm going to write, well, I'm going to try to write. I'm not going to be all right with that one. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to attempt to write again. Praise the Lord. <laughs> now, I'm going to write something on the board. What am I writing? Now, the devil will want me to stop right there. Because then you say, I got him now. I've been waiting for that preacher to get into some trouble. I'm going to put something there, though. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Now, why plus? What does plus mean? More. What does minus mean? Less. Now, my brothers and sisters, 2025 plus or minus means something to every believer in the word of God. I'm going to go a little further. It means something to even the historian who knows history or the scientist who knows science or the economist who knows economy or the collapologist who knows about the collapse of societies. You say, I didn't even know that was a subject. We're going to show you a subject before it's over called collapsology. There's a, a whole field of, uh, of knowledge called collapsology where they, 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 they master their experts on studying how things collapse. Now, my brothers and sisters, everyone who are experts in every field of knowledge, if you listen to the reality, they will tell us that there's something significant about what is happening. 2025, what's the next two words? Plus or minus. Now, my brothers and sisters, I showed you something last year that I want to put back up this year. I'm, we're gonna have to, what we're going to have to do, we're going to have to back up a little bit to understand where we left off last year. Show what has happened, what is going to happen, and what you and I need to be doing so we can be ready for what's about to take place. Do you want to do that, yes or no? Now, this says, let's go a little further. This says, the present is a time of how much? overwhelming interest to all living. Now, we're going to look at this statement over and over again because there's so much in it, we won't get it the first time. Sometimes I read a statement a thousand times and it may be the thousand and first that I get it. I mean literally a thousand times. It says, the present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. How many living? Rulers and statesmen. Men who occupy positions of what? Trust and authority. What type of men? I'm going to write that on the board. What type of men? thinking men. Now, if the man is thinking, you call this man a foolish man or an intelligent man? Well, this is an intelligent man. It says, thinking men and women of all classes have their attention fixed upon the dates. That doesn't say dates. It says that they have their attention fixed upon the what? So these thinking men are looking at what? They're looking at events. Now, I didn't say event. It says what? Events. Uh, events taking place where about us they are watching what are they watching the strained, restless relations that exist among the so that looking at the nations the thinking men are watching this now question is there a strained relation among our nations right now now it says they observe the intensity that is taking possession of how much every earthly 
element. That means that we should be able to look at every part of society and see the events taking place. Not just one field of, of knowledge. It says, and they recognize, who is this? Thinking men and women. I'm not talking about the prophet. That's not what it's talking about. It says, they recognize that something what? Great and decisive is far away. Is that what it says? That is about to take place. And what is it that they recognize by looking at the events going on in the, in, in the nations? What is it that they recognize that the world, not America, but that what? Now, if I call it the world, what is it? Talk to me. Something global is taking place. It says that the world is what? On the verge of a stupendous, what's the next word? Now, this is not the prophet. This is not the Bible. These are thinking men who are simply looking at the nations and the events and the relations that are happening among the nations. And the prophet says that they will recognize that the world is on the verge of a stupendous, what's that next word? Now, if the crisis is in a nation, what, what, what type of crisis, what we call that? A national crisis. If the crisis is in more than a nation, in fact, if it happens to the entire world, we would call that not a national crisis. We would call it a what? So the prophet says that just before we come to the final crisis, that not only the Bible, but even thinking men and women without looking at the Bible will be able to look at the nations and know that we're about to see a global crisis. Is that what the prophet says? Now, my brothers and sisters, my question is, do they see it? Yes or no? But you know what's amazing? Though they see it, most people are afraid to tell what they see. Because they're not looking at the date. They're looking at the what? But guess what? The event gives them, guess what? A date. The event allows them to zero in on a date. Now, my brothers and sisters, watch what they say because they see that something is about to take place. Now, let me put up a thinking man. Now, before it's over with, I'm going to show you by God's grace, field at the field at the field, showing us something that is very significant. If we're nearing the limit, what should we see developing in our world? If we're nearing the limit, if we're really about to see the world come to an end, what should we see taking place in the world? Talk to me, somebody. We should be seeing a what? Talk to me. Not just a crisis, but a what? A global crisis. Do we see it? Yes or no? Now, watch this now. Why the fall of the American empire will come by what? Now, we showed you this last year. I'm going to bring us back up to speed for just a moment. But we saw that it says why the fall of the empire will come by what year? But this says 2025 what? Now, here is not a Bible student, but here is an historian. Now, I've showed you before that this article is taken from the big what? What did the prophets say what recognized what was going on in the nations? It will come from what type of man? I wonder if this newspaper will tell us about the thinking men. Yes or no? Big thing. Now it says, what's the first letter of his name? What's the first name? What is the first word rather? Historian Alfred McCoy explains why the American power is coming to an end and lays out his vision for this new global order. Now notice the year. What's the year? 2017. Now notice what he says. 2017. Notice what he says. He says, the historian writes that how much? All negative trends that are plaguing American. Now, when is he writing this? What year is he writing this? 2017. He said, all ne uh, negative trends that are plaguing America now are likely to get much worse, growing rapidly by. When is he writing this? How many years before 2020? Three years. Now, here's an historian writing three years. Before 2020, and he tells us that the crisis will pick up drastically what year? Historian. But we don't have to worry about him. He's a bad historian because nothing happened in 2020. Am I right? Did something happen? No, we, we were showing these articles before 2020. Am I right? I, we were showing this article years and we told you at this camp meeting before 2020 that something was going to happen in 2020. Did we not say that? Yes or no? Based on history. Based on the Bible. Based on the spirit of prophecy. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says growing rapidly by 2020 and will reach a critical mass when? No later than what? 
Now, how is this historian coming to this conclusion? Is he saying any, many, many, mo, 20, 30, here we go? That's not history. So my brothers and sisters, what is the man looking at? What is the historian looking at? Because you know what happens? Sometimes you say something like this, and you know when somebody comes up, they say, well, old minister, you can't say 2025, plus or minus. That's not so. And this is what they say. They say, that's not so. Because it's not so. And I say, well, what, what makes you think it's not so? Well I, I, well, I just don't believe that we can say that. But that's not history. That's not science. That's not Bible. That's foolishness. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, let's go a little further. How America will collapse by what? Same historian. When did he write this one? 2010. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want you to understand, what are these historians looking at? Because if they could see it by looking at history, should we be able to see it by looking at history? Yes or no? And what has God given us with history? Prophecy. In the book of Education, the chapter is called History and Prophecy. Now, notice something that inspiration tells us about this very thing. Here's history. Now, out of all of our studies, history is best qualified to reward all research. We've got to understand history. And you know what the devil doesn't want us to understand? Talk to me, somebody. History. 2025, plus or minus, it's history. Now, volume 5, 6, 8, 75, watch what the prophet says. It says, Satan has the ability to suggest what? Doubts and to devise objections to the appointed testimony that God sends. And many think it is a virtue and mark of intelligence in them to be unbelieving and to question and what else? Quibble. Those who desire to doubt will have plenty of room. God does not propose to remove how much? I want to ask you a question. When Noah said, in 120 years, the flood was coming. Did they offer some doubts as to why they thought the flood was not coming? Yes or no? Did God remove all of those possibilities of doubt? Did he remove all of them? Did the flood come? Did he give them evidence? Enough evidence. So even though that there were some doubts, he gave them enough evidence to make a decision, an intelligent decision based on the weight of evidence. Are you following me? Now watch what this says. He gives evidence, which must be, what's the next two words? Carefully investigated. Now somebody says, but that's not faith. No, 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 that's faith. The Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. That's what Noah took when he got ready to build the ark. Noah had evidence. By faith, he built the ark. Evidence he was basing it on. Now, it says he gives evidence, which must be carefully investigated. How? With a humble mind. And what else? No, don't come and say, well, you can't teach me anything. I'm just going to believe whatever I believe no matter what. That, that's not going to help us. We have to be willing to say, whatever you say, Lord, I will accept it. You know what inspiration says? In the last generation, we have much to unlearn and much to learn again. It says, God gives how much evidence? Talk to me, somebody. Sufficient evidence for the candid mind to believe, but he who turns from the weight of evidence because there are a few things which he cannot make plain to his finite understanding will be left in the cold, chilling atmosphere of unbelief and questioning doubts and will make shipwreck of what? Faith. So now what happens now if I go to the Bible and God tells me to decide, what's the three words there? What's the three words there? Weight of, now you can look that up in the spirit of prophecy. You'll see hundreds of quotations surrounding that we are to make all our decisions based on the weight of evidence. Now, my brothers and sisters, if you look at this, it says, well, that, does that mean when you have the weight of evidence, there'll be some, you'll be able to explain everything? Is that what it means? He said, there may be a few things you can't explain, but you can look at the weight. Now, let me ask you a question how weights work. Let's say right now I have oranges, and I want to weigh the oranges. And I have a bag of 20 oranges. How many oranges? 20. And I take 18 of those oranges out of the bag. How many? How many are left in the bag now? Now, I take 18, and I put the 18 oranges on one side. And I weigh them. And they're all the same shape and the same size. And I weigh the 18 pounds, and then all of a sudden, uh, those two oranges I put on the other side, which one is going to be more weighty? The one that has more evidence. Are you following me? I hope you follow me. 
What I want you to do as we study together, because there, are, there has been an onslaught of persons that have come together that are so upset and so troubled about the concept of 2025 plus or minus because the devil's afraid of this. That he's made a conglomeration of people on the internet and all over the world that are trying to say, you don't have to think that 2025, anything's going to happen. But I don't actually believe me. Not because I say so, but because facts say so. Because the evidence says so. I want you simply to weigh the evidence. And when you go to a person, and they tell you, you don't have to believe in 2025 plus or minus, or thinking that this exodus needs to take place right now, all you have to ask is where is the evidence of why you say what you say? And they say, well, you know, I just don't think that it can happen. Is that evidence? Not that evidence. And you, you, you'll be amazed. And then you, you talk to the historian. They, they, we're going to show you those who are experts in history, experts in science, experts in the economy, experts in this, experts in that. And then you ask this person, well, I don't think that history is right. Have you studied history? Oh, no, I never studied history before. Well, I don't think the economy could do that. Well, have you studied economy? No, I never studied economy before. That's not evidence. God is telling us that we're to look at the weight of evidence and then make our decision. What do you say? And I'm going to show you by the grace of God that the weight of evidence says, I promise you, listen to me very carefully. It will be a divine miracle. A what? It will be a divine miracle for us to make it to 2025 without a crisis. A miracle. Does God work miracles? He works miracles. Does he always work miracles? He doesn't always work miracles. You know, Herod wanted him to work some miracles right before him when he was standing before him. Am I right? Did he work any miracles? He didn't work any miracles. So my brothers and sisters, what we have to do, we cannot trust. Do you know that it could happen this year? Plus or a little bit before 2025, a little bit after 2025. Now, if I make a statement like that, we should be able to go back to history, to science, to economy, to, 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 to all of the fields of knowledge, to go back, most importantly, to the Bible and verify that all of these things are what has been said. Do we need to do this? Yes or no? Do you want to do this with me? Because my brothers and sisters, I want to tell us what we're studying is making the exodus and the Adventist home. What are we studying? Making the exodus. Now, if you follow year by year, you will notice that a progression is taking place. Not only do we now need to know that there is an exodus, we need to start doing what? Making the exodus. Is there a difference between knowing there's an exodus and actually making an exodus? Yes or no? You know that the children of Israel for over 400 years knew that there would be an exodus out of Egypt. But they didn't make one. 400 years, they knew that there would be an exodus. You and I, as seven Adventists, over 100 years, knew that an exodus would have to be made. But my brothers and sisters, knowing an exodus must be made is not the same as making the exodus. You know, it takes something to make an exodus. You have to leave some things behind. Am I right? Some things have to be left behind to make an exodus. And my brothers and sisters, we're going to find that if we're going to make this exodus, a lot is going to have to be left behind. Do you want to make this exodus with me? Yes or no? By God's grace, as one of his under shepherds, we want to help all of us to make the exodus. And I don't want to lose one of us. That together we can make this exodus. What do you say? And we want to begin learning how. But do you know that you will never make an exodus until we first. Now somebody's tricking this clown. <laughs> Now, my brothers and sisters, I believe that if we understood how close we really were, we would be wanting to make everything possible to put it down so that we can be ready for this great crisis. Let's stop right here and pray. Let's ask God, Lord, help me to make the exodus. Make it up in your mind right now. Whatever it takes, whatever needs to be left behind by the grace of God, I want to do it so we can make this exodus together. Amen. Would you join me as we reverently kneel as we approach the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, 
we are at the heart of our study this evening. This is the crux of the matter in this first presentation. Lord, I beg of you that you would allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us in a way that is clear. In a way that is simple, in a way that we can understand that will show us that if ever there was a time to make the exodus, it's now. And that if we will not make this exodus, we will be lost. The only way to save our families is to make this exodus. The only way to develop this relationship with Jesus is to make this exodus. The only way to be in a position to reach the world is to make this exodus. The only way to have outpost centers that can finish the work is to make this exodus. The only way to prepare a people to stand true to you, dear God, during the investigative judgment is to make this exodus. And it cannot happen if we do not have an Adventist home. And so, Lord, as we begin to study tonight, I beg of you that you would take control of my lips, my heart, my mind. I'm fickle, feeble, frail, but you can speak to us, through us, through me, to all of us so that we can be ready to meet you in peace. Bless us now, Lord, as we get into our, the heart of our study more fully. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans, the book of Romans, what book did I say? We're going to the book of Romans chapter 13. We want to jump quickly to the heart of our study. In Romans chapter 13, I want us to understand something very significant. We're not living in an ordinary time. We're living in the most solemn and significant time of all the ages. Is this right or wrong? This is the most significant time. Now, my brothers and sisters, never in the history of the world have we been upon a crisis so heavy as the crisis that we're going up against right now and never has it been so clear and so evident as it is right now evidence is stacked upon evidence fact is stacked upon fact truth is stacked upon truth so that you and i can see without a shadow of a doubt that this crisis that we've heard about for over a hundred years is not coming we are in the development of this crisis even as i speak tonight Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Every end time biblical prophecy of the Bible is taking place right before our very eyes. Everything that God said is happening. And no matter which way we turn in society, we can see it in every field of knowledge. Am I right or wrong? Every field. Politically, economically, spiritually, socially, religiously, environmentally, everywhere we turn, the handwriting is on the wall. And all of it is saying this world cannot continue much longer. Now, my brothers and sisters, if ever there was a time to run to Jesus, it's now. If ever there was a time to gather our families and set our house in order, it's now. If ever there was a time to make an exit, exit out of the Babylonian worldly system, it is now on to God's plan so that by God's grace, we can be in position to finish the work. It's now, brothers and sisters. In fact, notice what the Bible says, Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Verse 11, let's read that together. The Bible says, and that, what everybody, knowing the time. Does it say guess the time or know the time? And that knowing the time, that not tomorrow, not next year, that what? Now it is not part of the time, but what? In other words, there's no time more urgent than this. Now is it high time to awake out of sleep. Why? For now is our salvation nearer than what? My brothers and sisters, never have I been more convinced than anything in my life that this is it. Not by cliche, not by ideas, but by evidence, by the facts and weight of evidence that this cannot go on much longer. And God is trying to show us that if it were to fall apart and collapse now, not one of us would be ready. Not one. Somebody says, oh, I know I will be ready. No, my brothers and sisters, not one. God right now is trying to tell us if we are going to be ready, we must make a decision now. Lord, me and my house, please do something to save us. And then use us to save someone else, not by saving them, but by pointing them to Jesus. Now, my brothers and my sisters, what I want us to see is that God is trying to show us something about an exodus that must be made. 
And inspiration says something very clear. We'll come back to this. Inspiration says something very clear. It says, what, now I'm, I'm, I'm asking this question. What is one of the first things that we must understand if we will successfully make this final exodus? Do you want to make an exodus, yes or no? We're not talking about knowing an exodus. We're talking about actually taking the first step and making the exodus. Now, in order to make the exodus, there's something that we must understand, something we must know. I'm going to ask you. What is it do you think that we must know if we're going to make the exodus? Someone says Jesus. Yes, we must know Jesus, but there's going to be something that will make us even want to know Jesus more. Someone said, I understand time. You, you're getting close. <laughs> but now watch. Let, let's go to the book of Exodus. Let me show you something. Let's go to Exodus chapter 1. We'll come back. We'll, we'll come there. Let's go to the book of Exodus chapter 1. Let me show you something. Now, the children of Israel... Did they just come into Egypt and make an exodus? Did they just say, you know what, I'm in Egypt, I'm going to make an exodus. Is that what they said? So the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus does not start with the children of Israel wanting to make an exodus. Isn't that interesting? The book of Exodus, now if we want to know how to make an exodus, what do you think might be a good book to study if we want to know how to make an exodus? Well, the book of Exodus. <laughs> I think God makes it simple. What do you say? Now, look at what the Bible says in Exodus. About how to make the Exodus. Now, Exodus chapter 1, question. What's happening, Exodus chapter 1? Look at what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 1, beginning in verse 7. Are you there, amen? Let's read it together. The Bible says, and the children of Israel were, what's the next word? Fruitful. Now, give me another name for fruitful. Prosperous. Now, rich, increase with what? Goods. Now, I want to ask you a question. When a man is rich and increased with goods, he's ready to make an exodus right then, isn't he? When the book of Exodus opens up, they're not even thinking about an exodus. Now, my brothers and sisters, something has to happen to change their minds. Something must happen to make them want to make an exodus. Now, notice what the Bible says in verse 7. The Bible says, and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed how? Talk to me, somebody. Exceeding mighty. And the land was what? They weren't thinking about making no exodus. They were thinking about making a career right there in Egypt. They had their houses in Egypt. Their businesses in Egypt. They had their families in Egypt. They had everything. Everything they had was in Egypt. Now, why would they want to make an exodus if everything they had and was dear to them was right there with them? They wouldn't want to make an exodus. Do we remember another person that Jesus said to remember? Do you remember anybody Jesus said to remember? Anybody? Remember Lot's wife. What happened to Lot's wife? Now, Jesus understands what keeps us from making an exodus. And Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Now, she started to make an exodus, but she did not succeed. Why did she not succeed? Because of what she still had left in the city. Someone said, I didn't think she left anything in the city. She left her mind in that city. And you and I are leaving our minds in Babylon. Leaving our minds in Egypt and then come to camp meeting and saying, we think we want to make the exodus. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying, dear God, I don't want to say that anymore. I don't know about you, but I'm making it my mind right at this camp meeting. I said, dear God, I wasted too much time last year. I want to redeem every moment, every hour, every second, because the more evidence shows me that I don't have more time to play. Now, my brothers and my sisters, look at what happened. They were fruitful. They weren't trying to make an exodus. And then verse 8 says, now there arose up a what, everybody? New king over Egypt, which knew not. Now, that makes sense if you studied the book of Genesis and then read into the book of Exodus. See, Joseph was somebody in, in, in Genesis. Am I right? Somebody in Egypt. Now, my brothers and sisters, you must understand, do you know that the Israelites did not pay taxes? They were exempt from taxes. They were exempt. They, they had the best part of Egypt. They had the best land. And you remember, land is the basis of God's plan of prosperity. All of the best of the land was given to the children of Israel because of Joseph. Now, my brothers and sisters, they were in the most favorable position to rise to the top. And while they were there, do you know what God wanted to happen? God wanted them at the very top 
of Egyptian life. God wanted them to actually step off and say, you know what? We're going to make an exodus. You know what the Egyptians would have said? Where can you go that is better than this? What job can you do that is better than this? What land can you have that is better than this? My brothers and sisters, God intended their exodus to be far different than what it was. And it would have been a testament to the beauty of the plan of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine building a business in this world and it's making billions? But then finding the truth of the third angel and recognizing that that business is not in harmony with the blueprint that God gave us. And then leaving that business and going to start a family ministry business based on the blueprint that God gave us. Leaving a school that's at the height in all the world looks at the school and says, this is the, the most wonderful institution, but it's not following the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. It's not following the blueprint. A medical facility not following the blueprint. That instead of sanitariums that God called for, we have a totally different thing. And, and, and God wanted that his people in embracing this truth with Jesus to look at all that and step away and it would have become a testament how and we would have showed that we have something better. Without needing even to condemn, we would have showed something better and the world would have been brought to a knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus. But Israel didn't do that. Israel got satisfied, but Israel, they're much, they're much worse than us. We, don't, we haven't got satisfied in this world, have we? And so it says, but a new king arose, which knew not Joseph. And then the Bible goes down and tells him what they did. Look at verse 10. It says, come on, let us deal wisely with them. Now, who's talking? Anybody know who's talking? Pharaoh. Now, let's translate that. Let's translate that. Who's talking? The government. Who, who said that? That's right. Somebody said that. The government is talking. The government engineered a plan of how to destroy the people of God. The worldly government engineered, not accidentally. It was a plan of how to eliminate the people of God. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says, let's deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And they come to pass when there fall off out any war, they join also into our enemies and fight against us. And so get them out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them. Talk to me, somebody. Now, maybe you know what happened to make them want an exodus now. I'm going to ask you again. I know you don't want to say it, <laughs> but you've got to say it. What is one of the first things that we must understand if we will successfully make this exodus? Talk to me, somebody. We've got to understand that we're slaves. Someone said, oh, man, he said it. I thought he forgot it. Every camp meeting that God allows until we come out of slavery, I'm going to remind you somewhere in it that you're a slave. You're a what? Oh, I'm no slave. My family came on the Mayflower. <laughs> Bless your heart. <laughs> I'm no slave, you say. Well, how come you don't have nothing? How come I don't have nothing? You know, what are some of the quali what are some of the identifying marks of a slave? Anybody know some of the identifying marks of a slave? Because see, the only way to know what a slave is, you gotta look at some evidence. Am I right? What's some identifying marks of a slave? Anybody can tell me some. Give me, give me some. Talk to me quickly. Yes. No assets. How much, how much did a slave own? How much did he own? You know it was against the law for a slave to own property. Against the law for a slave to own land. Against the law, he couldn't do it. Someone said, well, I don't own land. Well, you, you, you're surprised. Now, nah. give me some more. Give me some more. Give me. He asked with the, yes, sister. I can't go to camp meeting because my boss. Now, just look at how that sounds. You know what the slave used to say? Yes, yeah, sir, boss. That's the, that's the, that's the new, that's the new, you say, you say, uh, boss today, that, that this is the contemporary application. Back then it was master and that's what he really was. You know, <laughs> he was your master. Now my brothers and sisters, he said, yes, sir, master. Slave. Anytime that you have to get permission to go somewhere and, and God has told you to go to camp and God said he required of us. And you said, well, I got to get permission first. From who? 
God already gave us permission. We read it. My master gave me permission. And that's why I'm here right now. Now, my brothers and sisters, the same should be true for all of us. Now, this is talking about getting out. Give me some more. Give me some more. Give me some more. Talk to me, somebody. Brand it. Got a mark that shows that, that, that there's something different. What about, talk to me, somebody. What about the loss of a home? Do you know that slavery destroyed families? You go to any slavery, biblically, look at the slaves. Daniel. Where was Daniel's parents? Were they in Babylon with him? So what did slavery do to Daniel? It broke the home up. Joseph was a slave in Egypt. What, where was his mother? Where was his father? Where was his brother? Where was his sister? They were broken. Slavery has broken our families. My brothers and sisters, the reason why our family is in the condition we're in is because we're slaves and don't know it. We will never have good marriages as long as we're slaves. You know that, 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 that when a man was married in slavery, the master could take his wife and sleep with her. And the master and the slave better not say anything. Well, he got 50 lashes. I saw the picture of my eyes, a, a man, his whole body from shoulder to legs, nothing but welts because of him being beat by the master. Now, my brothers and sisters, there's a crueler master. His name is the devil. Now, I want to ask you a question. What happens to the language when you're a slave? What happens to the tongue? It's taken. Daniel, what is the Bible saying? Daniel chapter 1, he was taught the tongue of the Chaldean. Why destroy the language? Why take away the language? Any time that a nation or a country was colonized, they never let the one that was enslaved speak in their own language. Always the language of the slave master. Why was that, brothers and sisters? Listen, language is the foundation of communication. Communication is the foundation of education. Education is the foundation of learning. It means that you will be cut off from education and learning if you destroy language. I want to ask you a question. You know that there used to be a song that was sung by the slaves. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Broke up the home. Sometimes they, 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 they would say to the slave, he was dumb. Now, you know, we get the, they get the idea. You know, we say that person's dumb. And today, oh, he's not intelligent. He's dumb. We, we, we mean he's not intelligent when we say that, but we don't understand and trace it back to his original source. You can think about three things, being deaf, blind, and dumb. Being what? Deaf. What does deaf mean? You can't hear. Blind. What does it mean? You can't see. Dumb. What does it mean? Why is it that we call people dumb when they can't speak? So when a person can't speak, they're dumb. Why? Their language has been uh, taken from them. Once their language is gone, communication is gone, knowledge is gone, education is gone, and now they're ignorant of who they are. Ignorant of their identity. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The reason why our young people are suffering, as well as the adults, our families, is because we have lost our identity. Why is it that we see our families acting like the world, families acting like Babylon? We don't need condemnation. We need what? Education. All of us need to be educated as to our true identity. So much does slavery destroy identity. But right now, and I say, well, what were the friends of he, uh, uh, Daniel? You tell me, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the only thing that goes is your mind if you said that. That is not their names. What were their true identities? What were their real names? Talk to me, somebody. Hananiah, what else? Meshach, and what else? Azariah. Now, my brother and sister, do you know that today, what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist, we have lost sight of it. Do you know that God intended that the Seventh-day Adventist would be the most beautiful thing in the entire world, that the world would look and watch Seventh-day Adventist families and say, this is like heaven on earth. What did you do to your marriage to make it so heavenly when marriages are falling apart right now? Please show me. I've had families crying in tears where wife and husband calling saying we believed in the message we are doing this and that but somehow we are no longer able to live together and are getting divorces and separation and it's a wonderful thing that you can go and show the plan of Jesus and solve the problems of what is taking place in the home do you know that God wanted every seven heaven his family to be just like heaven upon this earth the children loving God 
Today, it's almost hard, hard pressed to find a child that really loves the word of God. He spends more hours on cell phones and on devices than he does upon the word of God. And it's not the fault of our children. It's not their fault. I don't look at our young people and condemn them. My brothers and sisters, the problem is us. We have brought them. They have, we have given birth to them inside of slavery. And we didn't tell them they were slaves. See, so when a man knows he's a slave, he recognizes that he has lost something. He wants to be free. But if you think you're free, you're not trying to make no exodus. The book of Exodus did not start with them trying to make an exodus. Are you following me? What is the one, and one of the first things that we must understand if we will successfully make this final exodus? Talk to me, somebody. What is one of the first things we have to understand? I heard half of you. If you don't say it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it enough to you until you, until you dream about it. <laughs> You'll wake up. I'm going to say you're a slave. You're you going to see my finger pointing at you. You are a slave. You're going to wake up. I'm a slave! <laughs> then maybe we'll make an exodus. Amen? <laughs> now listen. Back to school. Pop quiz. You didn't know you were getting a pop quiz, did you? What is our true condition? You know it now. What is our true condition? Tell me. Free or slave? Can you imagine all throughout the Bible, you know, seven Adventists have been known for being abolitionists. You know that Joseph Bates was an abolitionist, literally. James White was an abolitionist, literally. Sister White was an abolitionist. You go back, look at the history of our faith. Our pioneers were abolitionists. Listen, I'm an abolitionist. <laughs> Are you an abolitionist? A abolitionist means you want to abolish that system of slavery. I want every seven Adventist to become free. Not, now don't misunderstand. I'm not talking about becoming a free seven Adventist. Now everybody may not know what I'm talking about. Some people know what I'm talking about. That type of Adventist is not free. He's independent, but he's not free. Now, my brothers and sisters, it says you are a what? Slave. What are you? I didn't hear you. What are you? You say, oh, how can you talk to me like that? I'm a slave too. We're in the same boat, but listen, I'm a slave that knows he's a slave. And so you know what I want to do? Make an exodus. And by God's grace, I've already started moving. And I, wanna, I don't want to stop. I was talking to God last night. Oh, we had such, I was with the Lord, and it was such a beautiful time. While the camp was slumbering, me and Jesus was talking. I said, Lord, this is so good. This is so good. And I just said, Lord, I wish I could speak like Jesus. Because, see, Jesus is clear. He's concise. He's simple. But my mind is so foggy. My mind is so weak. I want to be like Jesus. What do you say? I'm going to try to give as much as we can. We have, we have a little more time. Now, it says, the, look, among his hearers, many were drawn to him in faith. And to them, he said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you what? Now, listen to what it says. These words did what? Offended. In other words, Jesus was saying to them, you're slaves. And they were offended. You know, sometimes you say you're a slave, you're offended. Some, I'm not going back to camp meeting because he said I'm a slave. I have to tell you again, you're a slave and so am I. I told you I got to tell you the truth. If we don't know the truth, we'll never make the Exodus. That's how the book of Exodus starts. Now, my brother and sister says, these words offended the Pharisees. The nation's long subjection to a foreign yoke, they disregarded and angrily exclaimed, angrily, we be what? Look, I was on the Mayflower. It says, and we are never, we're never in bondage to any man. How says thou, you shall be made free. Jesus looked upon these men, the what? Talk to me, somebody. The slaves of malice, whose thoughts were bent upon revenge and sadly answered, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the, give me another name, give me another name, is the slave. If we are not yet sinless, we are slaves. The greatest evidence that we're slaves is the fact that we're still in bondage to selfishness and sin. And there's only one that can abolish the chains that sin has upon us. And his name is Jesus. He was the real leader of the Exodus. Someone said it was Moses. No, uh, God told us through the Apostle Paul that, that they followed that rock and that rock that they followed was Christ. Jesus. 
must take us out of this exodus. Lead us through this exodus. It says, they were in the worst kind of bondage, ruled by the what, everybody? Spirit of what? Evil. Every soul that refused to give himself to God is under the control of another power. He is not in his own. He may talk of freedom. But he is in the most abject what? In other words, he's in the worst kind of slavery. You know, oh, yeah, I'm free. But you know, how you, you know how you can really tell when a man is free or not free? When the man says he can stop something. You know, a man said, I, uh, uh, I'm, no, I'm no slave to the internet or to the television. He said, well, just stop watching it. Stop looking at it. And, well, I can't do that. You know, <laughs> I can do it anytime I want to, but not now. You know, you can tell when, when a man takes drugs and then he doesn't take them for a little while, he goes through something called a what? And you can tell when a man hadn't taken drugs. Am I right? They're the jitters. A shake. You know, he's like, I got to get a quick fix. My brothers and sisters, when you understand this, you can begin to start seeing that, that, that all you have to do is say, is there anything in my life that I know that Jesus does not approve of? That does not develop my relationship with Christ, and yet I cannot put it down. People watching, listening, doing, saying, thinking, all of us have to examine ourselves and say, Lord, is there any idol that needs to come out? That's in the way of my soul and Jesus and my family that needs to be cleansed out of our home. This is what this is about. We need Jesus, brothers and sisters. Now, this says, he is not allowed to see the, what's the next word? The beauty of truth for his mind is under the control of Satan. While he flatters himself that he is following the dictates of his own judgment. He obeys the will of the prince of darkness. Christ came to break the shackles of what? Now go to the book of John. What book did I say? Go to the book of John chapter 8. The Bible says that Christ came to break the shackles of sin slavery from the soul. Look at John chapter 8. And notice what the Bible says in John chapter 8 beginning in verse 32. John chapter 8. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 32. Let's read that together. The Bible says, and ye shall, what everybody? Know what you want to hear. Is that what it says? You shall know the truth and the truth shall do what? What do we need if we're going to get out of slavery? Talk to me, somebody. Truth. Present truth. What is present truth? Jesus said, I am. What is I am? What tense? Past, present, or future? Present. So Jesus said, I am present. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. I am truth. So then who is Jesus? Talk to me, somebody. Present truth. So the only way that you and I can be made to be freed from this slavery is to have Jesus. And notice verse 36. If the Son, that is Jesus, Therefore shall make you free. Ye shall be what everybody? Free indeed. That's real abolition. Real freedom. Now my brothers and sisters, that means that this week, what, what do we have to hear if we're going to come out of this uh, slave? What do we have to hear? Talk to me. Truth. Who do we need with us with what we hear to get out of this? We need a person whose name is Jesus. Now my brothers and sisters, this is what God is trying to take us. Now once we know that we are slaves, then we're in a position to get ready to make an exodus. Now we want to make an exodus. When you get ready to want to make an exodus, now there's something else we need to know. What now? Now that you say I'm a slave, I see now that I can't have nothing. Do you know that everything you do as a slave does not help you, but only helps the slave master? If the slave worked more hours, the money went to the slave? Where did it go to? If the slave worked harder, the money went to the slave? So no matter what he did to improve himself, the only thing that it did was go to the slave master as long as he was a. So the only way to advance, the only way to go forward, we have to come out of this slavery. And so my brothers and sisters, now do you want to make the exodus? Yes or no? So then what is one of the first things once we know we're slaves, want to make the exodus? What is it that God wants to tell us now? He wants to tell us something in Exodus chapter 12. Look at Exodus 12 quickly. Exodus chapter 12. What book did I say? We're going to Exodus 12 and God now in Exodus 12, God is beginning to start. The exodus. He is getting ready to make Israel make the exodus. Now notice what he does at the beginning. Now what event started the exodus? Anybody? There was a literal event. 
What was the event? Talk to me, Brother Lopez. Passover. Passover started the Exodus. Am I right? Now, what was Passover a symbol of? The work of Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, if ever we're going to make that Exodus, Jesus must be the one leading the way. Now, look at Exodus chapter 12. Look what the Bible says in Exodus 12, beginning in verse 11. Let's pick up there quickly. Exodus 12 and verse 11. You're there, amen? The Bible says, and thus shall you eat it with your lo loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff. Where? Talk to me, somebody. Now, why would your loins be girded, girded your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand? What is that symbolizing? What is that symbolizing? I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I, I want to go. I'm ready. You, 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 I, th that's, a, that's an attitude of, I, I, I can't be here no longer. I want to leave right now. I'm ready to leave tomorrow. No, I'm ready to leave tonight. Now, this is the mindset of that man. Now, notice what it says. Now, it says, you shall eat it. What's the next two words? In haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, on the very next day, you know that the type of food that they were supposed to eat with that Passover? Unleavened bread. Why were they eating unleavened bread? Now, I know what you're going to tell me, but, but I'm going to let you tell me anyway. What, why were they eating unleavened bread? They were eating unleavened bread because everything to, with the dough was packed away. You read it. It says because everything was put away, they were having unleavened. Now, there was a spiritual application to that, but God was using the literal to teach them that they should have a spirit of haste. What does haste mean? Hurry up. Move quickly. Inspiration says in Country Living, page 21, I see the opportunity. I see the necessity of making what? Haste to get how many things? All things ready for the? What crisis? Is there a global crisis coming? Do the history men, the men in history, do they see it? Yes or no? It's a long way away, so we don't have to worry about any exodus. We all right, is that right? My brothers and sisters, it could happen this year. I'm praying, dear God, please give us enough time. So we're going to show you some things. I'm trying to build a, a layer foundation. I see the necessity to make haste to get all things ready for the crisis. Do we need to make haste right now? Look at verse 33. Exodus 12, look at verse 33. Verse 33 says, and the Egyptians were, what's the next word? urgent so when you make haste what should be inside of us what should be inside of us urgency it says in verse 33 and the egyptians were urgent upon the people uh, that they might send them out of the land what's the next two words in haste for they said we be all what now we'll come back to that and study that another another time that that, that that meant something when they were leaving egypt they recognized that egypt was getting ready to collapse egypt was getting ready to what so if we're getting ready to make an exodus what's getting ready to happen in america What's getting ready to happen to the world? So then we should be able to see if this is really time to make the exodus, the world collapses. You know, when it's time, you, you know, what does the word exit mean? What does it mean? Out. Ex. Out. When you exhale, you're letting air not in, you're letting air what? If you want to leave the building, you look for a what? Exit. Not a Brexit, but a what? Ex it. The exodus is to try to lead us what? Now, the last time that you see God leading the people out is in Revelation, the 18th chapter, when that angel comes from heaven and lightens the earth with God's glory, that final messenger of light that lightens the entire earth with God's glory. And he gives an announcement and says, come out of her my people, if he's calling them out, what are they making? So my brothers and sisters, in order to give the loud cry, we must learn how to make the exodus. If we do not know how to make the exodus, we will not be a part of the loud cry. Because the loud cry is a final exit from the world system. Physically and spiritually. Religiously and all the rest. And we're going to talk about it a little by God's grace. Now my brothers and my sisters... As that is happening, that exit that they're making out, is there a type of these people in the Bible? Was there ever an exit that was made out just like Revelation 18 talks about? Who led out in that exodus uh, on the earth? Who led on that exodus? Moses. Now, I want to ask you a question. Did Moses, under God's leadership, lead Israel out of Egypt? Yes or no? 
I want to ask you a question now. Had Moses ever made the exodus, or did he, was he making the exodus for the first time? Now, you're sounding a little bit confused right now. I'm, I'm going to ask you again. Was Moses making the exodus for the first time when he led the children of Israel out? He had done it before? How many years before? Now, listen to me, brothers and sisters. That means that those who give the loud cry, that's not going to be the first time they're making the exodus. To bring someone out, what must have happened to us first? We must already have been out. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means when the national sunny law is passed and we give the loud cry to the other sheep and other foes and every other denomination bringing in, because you remember, the majority of God's people are not in the Seventh Adventist Church. The majority of God's people are in the Catholic Church, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church. They're in the Amish faith. They're in the, some of them are not even going to church because they've seen the hypocrisy of those in church. Now, my brothers and sisters, many of God's people all over the world, not in the remnant, God's true church. But guess what? God is going to make a final exit of these sheep outside into his final body, the remnant church, for the finishing work. But those people who lead those, that great exodus will be just like Moses. That's why they're going to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. So they're going to have an experience similar to Moses, which meant that before they lead out in the exodus as a group, individually, they would have experienced an exodus in their own homes. Has your home made the exodus? And my brethren and sisters, you may say we're in the wilderness because we're not in Canaan yet. I can tell you that. If we're in Canaan, there should be some fruit that we're in Canaan. When you got to Canaan, there was fruit. Am I right? And if there's not this fruit in our home, in our lives, it's evidence we haven't yet been in Canaan. We're still, you may not be in Egypt, but maybe in the wilderness. I, look, by God's grace, I'm fighting in the wilderness. I got to get out. I'm, I'm trying to get to the promised land. And I'm trying to take my family with me. And then I want to be in a position that we can take everyone together. But this has to be the personal and family experience first before we can be successful and leading someone out. That's why it's called making the exodus and the Adventist home. Because unless we have that personal, individual, family experience, like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will never be able to be used by God to finish this work. I want to get into position. What do you say? Now, listen, as we get ready to bring it to a close, I, uh, we, 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 we're nowhere near we need to be, but uh, we get ready to bring it to a close. Now, we must talk the truth in private and in public, presenting every argument, urging every motive of infinite weight to draw men to the what? Savior, uplifted on the cruel cross. God desires how many? Every man to attain into eternal life. Let's read this together. Mark how, where, all through the word of God, there is manifest the spirit of what? Urgency. Do we need to have that if we're going to make the exodus? Yes or no? Now, my brothers and sisters, what has to happen? And we'll get ready to close on this. What has to happen if we're going to have the spirit of urgency? What is to produce the spirit of urgency? What does that? Not yet, not, not yet, brother. I, I, what is to produce the spirit of urgency? What is to produce the spirit of urgency? Talk to me, somebody. What is to produce it? I didn't hear you. Someone, someone said, someone said Christ, no, the crisis is not going to produce the spirit of urgency. We, we need something else before that. Before that, because we wait to the crisis, we're going to wait too late. Am I right? Now watch. Men of clear understanding are needed now. God calls upon those who are willing to be controlled by the Holy Spirit to do what? Lead out like Moses. That means we have to have a personal experience. In a work of thorough reformation, I see a what? Crisis before us. And the Lord calls for his laborers to do what? Come into line. Every soul should now not sit, but what? Stand in a position of deeper, truer what? That's why last night, Elder Marcus started with what? Consecration. This must happen first to God during the years that have passed. But then what? It says, it would be well for us to consider, what's the next words? What is soon to come upon the earth? Is something coming? Yes or no? Something's coming, brothers and sisters. It says, this is no time for trifling or self-seeking. If the time in which we are living, fail to impress our minds seriously 
What can reach us? Now, this is not what I'm saying. You know who said this? God is telling us this through the prophet. The testimony of Jesus says, if we simply had a better understanding of the time, you and I would have developed in us, born in us, the spirit of what? But the problem is, we don't understand. Uh, therefore, we don't know what to do. Go to First Chronicles chapter 12. Now, my brothers and sisters, there's a, a direct relationship to this because in the Exodus. Now, I want to ask you a question. What year are we in right now? What year are we? I'm going to put 2022 over here. We're after 2020. That was the beginning of the end in, in a great prophetic way. From 2020 forward, we're going to talk about it some more. Development increase, increase, increase. In 2022. Now, my brothers and sisters. If we do not understand where we are prophetically in 2022, there's no way that we'll be in a position to make the exodus. Question, did they make the exodus at any time or was the exodus a timed event? The exodus was a time event? Could children could they just wake up and say, you know what, I'll wake up, I'll make an exodus today. Or did it have to happen at a specific time? Now, my brothers and sisters, where did the idea of this time come from that the exodus was supposed to have? Look what the Bible says. Now, 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 what did I tell you to turn? Did, I, did you go there yet? First Chronicles 12. Let's go to First Chronicles 12. Now, I'll get that. First Chronicles 12 and verse 32. Let's read that. First Chronicles 12, verse 32, it says, And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had, what everybody? Understanding of the times. What for? To know what Israel, what? Ought to do. So that tells me, if I want to know what to do, I first must understand the so, in order to make the exodus, I must understand the time of the exodus. If we understood the time, we would know that in 2022, it's time to make the exodus right now. It's time. Once we know it's time, then we begin to start following the directions that God tells us. Now, we must take some time in 2022 to understand that it is time. Does the Bible tell us that the exodus itself was a time event? Yes or no? Look at Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Now, do you remember in the last part of Genesis, Heavenly Father, as we get ready to bring this message to a close, help us to see if ever there was a time to wake up and make this exodus. It is now. Help us, dear God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, brothers and sisters, I wish, I'm, 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 right now, I'm, I'm seeing how much we want to cover. I, I, I want to throw it all on you right now. But by God's grace, I'm trying to hold some restraint. <laughs> now listen. Acts chapter 7. You remember when, you know, I'm, I'm talking about Genesis, but we're going to Acts 7. You remember when uh, Joseph was getting ready to die. Do you remember what he said just before he died? It was the last chapter of Genesis, just before Exodus. Do you remember what he said just before he died? Did anybody remember what he said? I can hear you what he said. He said, look. We're in Egypt right now. But Joseph never wanted to remain in Egypt. Joseph's mind was always on the Exodus. He never got settled in Egypt. He never wanted his family. He told them, don't, they, they, they see, Pharaoh wanted to give uh, Joseph's brethren all the highest places in the government, all the highest places in society. But Joseph said, don't do it. He said, tell them that you, are, you have a different trade, a different occupation, a different system of living, that, that, that you are a country living shepherd. He said, because the Egyptians, they don't like that. They call that an abomination. And if you did that, they'll leave you alone. God was trying to preserve them through Joseph. Joseph never got settled there. Now, my brothers and my sisters, he said, when you make the exodus, he said, take my. He said, look, I don't even want my bones inside of Egypt. Now, he understood the state of the dead. But he said, look, even though I'm not there, I don't even want them to think I'm here. I said, man, Joseph was serious. And what Joseph was in Egypt, every seven Adventists is to be to the world. Now, my brothers and my sisters, Acts chapter 7 says this. Look at what it says. Acts 7. Let's read this together. Acts 7. Look at what the Bible says in verse 20. Acts 7 verse 20 says, in which time, what? Now, notice what it says. In which, what's that word? So Moses was born, guess what? You mean to tell me the deliverer was born on time? Someone says, well, how can, I, how can I be born on time? Well, if you're born again, you can be born on time. Now, this says that in which time Moses was born 
and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house. How long? Now, why did it say in which time? Back up. Verse 17. It says, but when the time of the promise drew what? Which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied where? So that tells us that there was a time that God gave to Abraham of when the children of Israel would come out of what? How long did he tell Abraham? How long did he tell him? 430 years. And do you know to the exact day they kind of came out of Egypt on time? That's the type. So that means that you and I in 2022 should come out of Egypt on time. But guess what I'm telling you right now in 2022? Guess what I'm telling you? It's time. Now, if it's time, what can the devil do to stop us if it's time? Remember the Egyptians, the mightiest nation in the world, the greatest military might, the greatest political might, the greatest in intellectual might, the greatest economic might could not stop a group of slaves when it was time for them to make the exodus. Do you know how encouraged we should be right now that we can get up and say, Lord, I can walk away from Egypt and Babylon because it's time to take a step in the direction that makes me have to let loose of this world and leave some things behind. We're going to have to leave everything behind, brothers and sisters. There was a vision that Sister White had going up this narrow way. And as they were going up, the first they were in loaded wagons. But guess what they had to do before it was over? They had to get out of those wagons. They had to get out of their luxury automobiles. They had to, off the wagons, they let it down. They had to cut loose of, the, uh, of their properties and, and got their things in a, in a much more handleable way. They started studying to economize. But eventually they had to leave those. They had to start walking on foot, single file, as they began to get closer and closer, more narrow and more narrow, until eventually they had to take off their stockings. They're talking about socks. They, they wore stockings, you know. They had to tear their socks. And the Bible uh, inspiration says that their feet started bleeding. I want to ask you a question. What do you think it's going to take to make the exodus? Someone says, you know, it's going to be a, it's going to be a walk in the park. Well, what exodus have you read about? We're going to be tested. And so God must allow us to go through little tests. Things that agitate us, the person I do. Were, were there things constantly happening in, in the wilderness that were agitating them? Were they murmuring and complaining? Evidence that they were not ready. God is trying to right now get out of us everything that is not like Jesus. Because something is about to happen. Listen to me. Listen to me clearly. I am not guessing about this. Before my teacher died and rested in the grave, he made by the grace of God me understand by the grace of God these points. This is it. I promise you. And what we have to do is not believe because I say so. Let's go to the facts and look at the weight of evidence. Do you know that the people will never give the call to come out? The first call is not Exodus. Come out. That's not the, that's not the first. You know what it says? As the glory of God is being revealed, it says Babylon is what? You know that people will never come out until you first identify that the place that they're in has already fallen. We're trying to bring people out where they're comfortable where they are. Nobody's going to leave like that. You've got to show them that the world is collapsing. Every nation collapsed. Every country collapsed. The econ economy of the world collapsed. The, the, the government of the world collapsed. The health of the world collapsed. Have you seen the health collapsing, yes or no? Do you know that the world was almost overwhelmed by the, the disease, the bacteria, the COVID that was introduced into the world? It was almost overwhelmed. And do you know that the disease is not over? Someone says, I'm glad we're past COVID. Nothing else is coming now. Well, you got to be out of your mind. Inspiration says in Great Controversy 588, 589, it says disease will become more and more frequent and disastrous. A greater disease is coming. You know, this is why God gave us the ministry of what? Healing, medical missionary work, sanitarium, country living. All of it is to preserve us and protect us so that we can give a message that becomes the solutions of the problems of life. The time is here 
You know, brother and sister, we're going to show you tomorrow, Lord willing. Listen. Do you know that right now there's a war going on that the media has forgot about after three months? Three months ago, it was everywhere. Am I right? What war? Talk to me, somebody. The war on Ukraine. Now, what I'm going to tell you is behind these slides, but if I try to go through the slides, I'll never make it. <laughs> I'll never make it, so I'm not even going to try that. I'm gonna, I'm, I, I, wanna, I just want to tell you something as we get ready close. I'm not teaching now. I, I stopped teaching. My, my time for teaching is finished. I'm getting ready to conclude. I'm telling you now. There's a difference between teaching and telling. And in God's plan, he both teaches and tells. Right now, I'm telling you something. You know that when Noah said that it was 120 years and a flood was coming in 120 years, Noah at that point was not teaching them. You know what he was doing? He, you know, he wasn't even asking. He wasn't even trying to. He, someone said, well, you know, Noah, l l let's, let's, let's weigh the evidence and see if you're right. That's not even what Noah was doing. Noah said, look, God told me a flood was coming. The world's coming in. That, that's it. So right now, I'm just going to tell you. 2025 plus some money. That's it. Now, as we go on, we're going to teach some more from the Bible. And we'll see it. But my brothers and sisters, this is it. We are at the point right now that war in Ukraine means something prophetically. We're going to show you that it happened on time. I said on time. Yes, on time. Now, my brothers and sisters, we're going to show that that war in Ukraine is much bigger. Oh, that, that's something going on in Ukraine and Russia. But I don't have any Ukraine in my family, so I'm all right. Isn't that what you said last year when the president got assassinated in Haiti? Well, I'm not Haitian, so it's all right. But we don't understand all this thing is connected. This is a global crisis. Now, listen to me. Russia. Is it important for the entire world? I'm just telling you something as we get ready to close. I'm telling you something. Do you know what is the greatest commodity that is sold in the entire world? The greatest commodity that is sold in the entire world. Oil. Do you know that one of the greatest suppliers of that oil to the majority of the world, guess who it is? Russia. Now, someone says, well, that's all right. But listen to me now. Right now, the majority of the world, the majority of the world is doing organic farming. Is that right? No. No. The majority of the world is not doing organic farming. <laughs> the majority of the world, they're using Mind the same old and all this other foolishness. Now listen. Do you know what Russia also does? Someone says wheat. Yes, Russia does wheat. All, all the majority of our wheat come from Russia and Ukraine. But the majority of the fertilizers of the world come from Russia. Now, we've cut off, uh, well, not we, they, and I'm not going to say me, you know. <laughs> they cut off access to different monies, to different ones in Russia, angering Russia. Do you think that Putin is going to say, you think in his mind, he'll say, you know, you have treated me so bad, so I'm going to give you all the fertilizer you need to continue. Now, do you know the fertilizer is what makes the crops, because of not following God's method of farming, the fertilizer, what makes the crop give the yield that he does, is what makes the crop not susceptible to insects like locusts, which makes it not so susceptible to drought, and as a result, we have a high yield. Now, with the war going on and all of this shortage is stopping, what do you think is getting ready to happen to the food inside of the entire world? Not the food for Russia or Ukraine, but the food for the world. A worldwide shortage. Now, I want to ask you a question. Someone says, well, that's going to tell you, you know, we're told that that's going to be a problem. When a man can't eat, it's, it's a tremendous problem. All you got to do is look at camp meeting. When a man doesn't eat, he gets upset. Am I right? You know how we get when you can't eat. In the time of Israel, when there was a famine, the mothers ate the children. Can a mother forget her suckling child? Yes, she can. But God said, I'll never forget you. What a God. Now, my brothers and sisters, in this crisis, God is trying to warn us of this. Now, let me ask another question. Right now, as of the last 20 years, something has changed. And the global system, something that is called a global supply chain. Anybody know what that is? Global supply chain? You know what that means? Do you know that right now that 90% of all of our goods, all of our products, all of our service, 90% of all of it is not made locally. 
You say, well, well, well I'm getting things that said made in, made in America. No, it's not made in America. It's assembled in America. It's made in Taiwan, made in Korea, made in Vietnam, made in China, but, but, but not made in America. And you'll find out even in China, things that are made there, they, they, it, there's, a, there's a, a mismatch of everything. And in order to make it work, there has to be what is called a global supply chain. But the global supply chain needs transportation. Needs what? And transportation needs oil. So as a result, whether you go by plane, by train, by water, you need energy. Now, my brothers and sisters, what happens? When this is all affected at one time, we see the system of the world collapsing. Do you know that already the price is not just of food, but of everything has gone up by 300%. Do you know that last year you could buy a 25 pound of flour, bag of flour, 25 pounds. You could buy it for about $30. This year it was over $100. That's over 300% in bulk. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that if the prices of everything is going up, but your paycheck is not going up because your master is not going to give you a raise. It's only a matter of time before the whole thing collapses. And we're going to show you, brothers and sisters, that it is a timetable that is in the Bible, it's in history, it's in science, it's in everything. And God is telling us as Egypt is collapsing, the people of God should be making a what? Exit out of worldly education, out of the universities of this world, into God's plan. Exit out of the health facilities of this world. Exit out of the uh, uh, the, 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 the institution of this world. Exiting out of the economy of this world. Exiting and so God can establish his heavenly economy. Because there's going to come a time when we're going to have to live without being able to buy or sell. We are not far from this time right now. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you see just a little bit? We, 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 we're closing. Just a little bit. That my brothers and sisters, we have no more time to play. Someone says, but dear God, there's a lot of things that must happen and I have nothing. I'm gonna, listen, it's so bad. Imagine if it was the 120th year and the ark had not even begun to be built. The 120th year and the ark had not even begun to be built. Let me tell you something. It took Noah 120 years to build the ark. If he had started at the 120th year, it would have been too late. He would not have made it. If you and I wait, not another year, not another month, not even another week. If we wait another day, we've waited too late. Now is the time. Now is the acceptable time. Someone says, but look, I've made so many mistakes. Have you ever made a mistake before? Is your family perfect? My family's not perfect. I praise God for the heaven that he's allowed us to taste, but there's so much more he wants to give to us. Have you ever made a mistake in your finances, your health? Do you want to get back on God's plan, yes or no? My brothers and sisters, do you know that the very first step, let's close in Hebrews chapter 7. Let's close in Hebrews 7. I want to give us the very first step tonight. In Hebrews chapter 7, I was talking to God and I said, dear God, last night, and then some nights before, I said, Lord, it's, it's so much that must happen. He said, tell them that the collapse is about to take place. But he said, tell them the same thing that I'm getting ready to tell you. I said, what is it, Lord? Because I wasn't praying just for everyone else at that time. I was looking in my own heart and I was saying, Lord, I want to be your friend. I want to have a relationship with you, Lord, deeper, that is more close, more intimate, more personal. And God said to me, one word, 
How many words? Just one. I said, Lord, that makes it very simple. Guess what the word was? She said, change. And that's a good word. But that's not the word he told me. In Hebrews chapter 7, we'll find the word. I'm going to see if you see it before I see it. Say it. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, the Bible says, in Hebrews 7, 25, it says, Wherefore he is able also to what, everybody? Save them to the uttermost. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now I skip something. Can God save us to the uttermost? What if we're so far from the blueprint, so far from God's plan? You know, it was a, it was a long way away, Exodus and Canaan, long way in the Exodus. What if we're so far from where God wants us to be? Can he save us, yes or no, to the uttermost? Will everybody be saved? Why? Because they're so far? What does the Bible say? The Bible doesn't say change. The Bible doesn't say true, uh, uh, disobedience. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says in Hebrews 7, it says, Wherefore he is able to save to the uttermost that, what's the next word? Come. In one word, the spirit and the bride Say, you know what the Bible says in Revelation? They say what? Come. Let him that heareth say, come. Drink of the water of life freely. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the water. Ye that have no money. Someone says, how can I make it? I have no money to make the exodus. Tell me, how much money did they have in, in, in Egypt? They had nothing until God worked a miracle. God will bring you out of the city into the country, but that's only the beginning. That, that's not the move. You can be in a, a, a country location and still have the city life. My brothers and my sisters, even with no money, he who have no money, come ye by and eat. The word of God is come. Jesus said, come unto me. Someone says, but Lord, I still have sin. Do you know what it says in Steps to Christ? I'm going to show you tomorrow night. I was going to show you tonight, but I can't get there. In Steps to Christ, page 31, it says Jesus loves for us to come to him just as we are sinful, helpless, dependent, messed up. Now I said, Lord, that's not hard because. I'm already like that. <laughs> I don't have to do anything in order to make this, to begin the exodus. I come just as I am. And if I try, I'm going to fail. If I try to do it by myself, the question is, can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or can the leopard change his spots? Then how can you and I do good that are accustomed to do evil? It's impossible of ourselves. Every one of us tonight can say, Lord, there's something in my life and my home that is not right. But I'm coming not after I fix it. I'm coming while the problem is still there. Listen, if we could fix it without Jesus, we wouldn't need a Savior. So my question is, do you want help tonight? Do you have a problem tonight? See, if you're perfect, God's not going to be able to help us. They that are whole need not a physician. But if you recognize that you're a sinner, you're a slave, but you want to make this exodus tonight, and you say, Lord, there's something in my heart there's sin in my life, but I'm not going to try to fix it first. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come to Jesus just as I am right now. I wonder if there's someone here that says, Lord, I want to make a decision tonight to come. If that's your desire, your desire, I want you to raise your head wherever you are. 
You're saying, Lord, time is running out. I want to make that decision right now. You may be on the internet. Raising your hand is just a decision. When you go back to your room tonight, tell God. Get on your knees and tell God. Lord, I come. Just as I am. Without one plea. But that your blood was shed for me. And since he bids me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're on the verge of a global crisis. Everything in this world is getting ready to collapse. And we're going to see this week that America has come to its limit. That what we see happening in the government on every field is indication of something. We're going to see, Lord, that it would take a divine miracle to stop the Sunday law from being passed before 2025. Lord, we're asking, please have mercy upon us. If it be possible, Lord, give us a little more time. We know that there's a limit. We know that there's a limit. Lord, stretch as much as you can, not so that we can waste it, but that not only can we get ready, but that we can help others before it is everlasting too late. I pause the prayer. Someone says, Lord, save me in my house. Just raise your hand. Lord, you see our lifted hands. We're raising them. I'm raising mine. Save us, Lord. Help us to make this decision tonight. We're coming just as we are, but we don't want to remain like this. We want you, Lord, to take us step by step. And if we keep coming to you, we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you for the lifted hands. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.